Hi, Louisa. Thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. I love having you here. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So I thought we would start with a random fact I found about you, which is that you have two brothers who gave you a nickname, Pud. And I wonder how did that come about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, when I was younger, uh, yeah, must be about 10 or so, um, I was quite a chunky little child um, and I like my food <laughs> before I started kayaking and uh, yeah they decided to call me pudding and then it got shortened to pud so um, yeah really basically because of how I looked um, me brothers uh, all that and yeah they decided and I did like pudding to be fair I still like pudding to be fair um, and then yeah they just shortened it to pud and yeah kind of stuck and even now 32 and I still get called that. Um, I think my name in their phones is that P-U-D. So, <laughs> yeah. Only families would do that to each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And But then, I mean, like, even though that's what they call you, you, as I understand, you were very active. I mean, you lived in Walton Thames, which is near a river, and you would go around with your mm-hmm. brothers and play with neighbours. Can you give us an idea of what your childhood was like? Yeah, so we were, so I'd say three of us were always outside in my parents' garden. Um, we played around tractors, swings, slides, everything. Um, and our neighbour where we neighbourhood where we lived was very sort of um, we go and play around it together in the park. And then yes, when I was ten, I started kayaking on the river, which is just sort of uh, four or five minutes down the road from where they live. Um, and yeah, just going to that. So it's a very active lifestyle. I love tea at school. I loved um, competing against my brothers and then that obviously transferred into my career. So yeah, very active. We always used to go on holiday and be in the swimming pool from the moment we we wake up to when we have to go to bed. Um, Always in the sea, doing water sports, banana boat. We were quite a a loud, crazy family, just always on the move. (laughs) Yeah, so it's just something that you naturally felt inclined to it. Yeah, yeah, and how how did the whole kayaking at Elmbridge Kennel Club happen though? Was it because oh, your whole family was going there? Yeah, so my older brother, uh, John, two years older than me, he went, he joined and I just thought, oh, it looks quite fun. I'll tag along. I like sports. I like water, being outdoors. And um, yeah, I sort of went down with him, with mum and dad and yeah, loved it. And just being outdoors, there's a really good group of friends that I sort of, you go through all the stages with, with through the years and I really enjoyed it it was just um yeah you every time you go down you get faster you learn something a new skill and for me that was just I loved gaining strength and yeah beating the boys as well it's quite fun <laughs> at that yeah. age when you're so young it's quite easy to beat the boys because you're all kind of the same level and then there's obviously when you go to hit puberty men become stronger than women naturally um but at that age when you're 10 12 you're kind of on a level playing field and I really enjoyed that kind of ability to beat boys and <laughs> yeah really, I think at the yeah, time you it. beat your own twin brother Nick and that's why he quit when he was young wasn't it yeah <laughs> yeah he um yeah he he said oh yeah he won't admit it he said that he got a headache when he went paddling but I think it was just that and he wanted to go off to play football and go to yeah go out with his mate so but I was happy I loved it and then yeah my brother went through the ranks I kind of followed him um, and it was really good to yeah have him as a, a sort of good figure to follow. So were you quite serious about the whole canoeing since from young? Yeah, I'd say so. I, I at weekends we went off to France and um, as a great British team, and you go off to Germany and race and compete. And I loved it. I I remember friends had birthday parties, and I just didn't. Not that I wasn't bothered, but kayaking was my sort of main driver. So. Um, my parents were always very open about what they said, you know, you can go if you want, you don't have to go. They weren't pushy at all, very, very supportive. And yeah, I think that was sort of half the the, the joy of it. For me, I, I thought I didn't have to go. It was my desire to go paddling and just get faster each time. It was, yeah, purely from me. Yeah. And were they training very yeah. seriously at the club at the time? Uh, I think, how often do we train? It must only be three times a week when you're sort of 10, 10, 12. Um, and then as you go through sort of 15, you sort of then go every day, maybe have a, a couple of days off in between. And then as soon as you come sort of 16, 17, you start adding in morning sessions and then you go after school. So it's a, it's a nice gradual progression. Um, obviously, if you jump in the deep end too early, you'll burn out. So it was a, the club was great at, at sort of stepping you up the levels 
and um, yeah, nice little steps as you go and yeah, taking you through them. Were there certain seasons where you couldn't canoe kind of, because, you know, winter, it might be harder to canoe kind of than in the summer, right? Yeah, British winters aren't nice. Yeah. <laughs> they're, um, they're very cold. We, uh, it, it's funny, when you're younger, it, it toughens you up almost. Um, the club was, if it was really snowing and really horrible weather, the club wouldn't go out for health and safety. But it made you tough. It made you sort of just put more layers on, be sensible to wear clothes after. Um, and yeah, you learn a lot about sort of keeping warm. And then when you get older, uh, when you sort of hit senior team, you go off to Australia for six weeks and train there or South Africa where it's nice and warm. So, um, yeah, you kind of, you, you get, yeah, the best of both worlds. You learn and then when you get older, you can have the, reap the rewards of going away to summer sunshine. <laughs> yeah. So going away to places like Australia, was that when you were already in the world championships and European championships? Yeah. So how old was I then? Must have been... 20 odd um and the, the team uh british team decided that it, in those winter months so from sort of november all the way through to february march the team would go away um even seville we went there at the beginning of the year um sort of january february march time to yeah get some warm sunshine and get some good quality paddling in a lot of countries uh kayaking would go off around to Seville so you probably see sort of the Hungarian team or the German team training out there you kind of have bases around the world that people go to just to get some warm weather in really. Is it better to go around and train different places like how does that build you as an athlete though? Um, I think it, it doesn't matter as long as the water is nice. Um, Seville is uh, very good for as I say, warm weather and it's only a couple of hours flight and then the base where the, there's a lot of sort of the national sports to hang out there and train out from. It's not far from the airport. Um, and it gets quite bumpy, which ultimately does actually help you. So ideally you want nice flat water. Um, and to train in water that's quite bumpy, even though it doesn't look bumpy, but these skinny boats can fill everything. It makes you prepare well for them when you're racing and you can't control what the weather's throwing at you if it's going to be... Um, yeah wavy and bumpy and horrible winds and if you trained in those conditions then you come out stronger because you've done it and it's normal almost whereas if you constantly train in nice flat water and it's nice glass and mirror then suddenly you go out to world championships and the course is horrible and windy as I say whether you can't control you're going to be yeah your confidence gone out the window you're going to flap you're going (laughs) to it's just going to be panic so yeah training in conditions that are bumpy now and again is quite good I think yeah I remember when I was doing competitive dragon boat racing we did it once at a sea and the waves were crazy you couldn't even stay in position yeah. just to get the proper start point was it what was the, yeah. like the hardest place for you to race because you've been all over the world there's a course in Poland um, Poznan and it's really really open it the wind can whip up all the way down so the course is usually two kilometers long and it starts nice at the top and then by the time you get down to the end the waves can be sort of a couple of meters high and they have occasionally called off racing because it's been so horrible but it's almost who can cope the best um so say if you usually so australians for example obviously have paddled in the sea they do surf ski a lot of them come from a surf ski background um, and they have very good ability to paddle in the waves, whereas other sort of smaller countries maybe have been exposed to that. They've been on lakes. Um, so yeah, it, it just depends how confident you are and your sort of upbringing. So my club, as I say, we went out whatever weather. If it was windy, you go out paddling. So I had I was very happy to paddle in the waves, where some people might not be happy. So it just it's you just have to kind of get used to it and. As I say unless they cancel the race then you got to go out there and do it <laughs> yeah and I think that people don't realize that when you are paddling it's not just about the strength there's a lot of tactics involved as well right like what kind of Absolutely. main tactics do you think is most important to bear in mind so there's two different types of races so you've got sprint and marathon so sprint is 200 500 or 1000 and then marathon you've got anywhere sort of 10 20 30k um the tactics for a sprint race if you're in a crew boat so um four of you in the boat you'll have to know exactly what everyone's doing so counting six strokes or if you're going to pick up a certain places 
um, as having a race plan that you've practiced so much in training that come race day, you can do it with your eyes closed. You can sit on the bank and you can visualize exactly what you're doing every meter almost for that 500 meters. Um, when it comes to marathon, I absolutely love the tactics in marathon. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it takes years of practice, um, but so there's a thing, so it's quite like uh, similar to cycling. You sit on people behind people's bikes to sort of uh, shield and sort of save energy. So there's a very similar thing in kayaking called wash hanging. So you sit on the wash and it almost tilts your boat up and it makes it a lot easier to paddle. So on, if you see a boat, they'll have waves coming out the side. So you're essentially sitting on that wave, boat tilts up and you're going downhill. So if you sit on that, it's easier, but everyone kind of wants to sit on certain washes that are nicer. So it's a real game of sort of moving around and obviously these boats are long, so it kind of hit people's boats. There's sort of playing nasty. Usually people who play nasty mean they're quite panicky and they're not very fast, so they'll play dirty almost to sort of cover their abilities. Whereas if you're very confident and you have the fitness and the speed, you know that you can easily get out of danger and move out of the group and then come round and find the wash hanging that you want something. So there's loads of tactics. If you go off the start, for instance, um, you kind of want to have nice clear water. You don't want to be in the washy waves. And then you want to sit on a nice comfortable wash. So your boat's tilted. Um, but then obviously someone's going to come on to take that wash. So it's, it's lots of games. You're going to get to learn um, what what countries, so as you race, what what they are, if they're a panicky paddler, <laughs> for instance, if they're going to sort of keep tapping your paddles because they want, they're just nervous. You can, yeah, you can get across if they're nervous or something. Whereas you have a strong athlete who you know is just going to paddle away from it all, just go to nice calm water and then come back in after. So it's at the marathon, there's, I could go on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah no, go it. on. Um, yes. I love it. It's, it's for me, it's, um, yeah, I love the games of it, um, the mind games. It's, it's basically a game of saving energy and then making sure you're there in a good position at the finish. It's, um, yeah, it, it, it takes a lot of practice and many years. I learned probably from the best club, is, yeah, to where and um, to position yourself and how to sort of watch out around people that's going around that's going on. So you're always listening for someone that's coming up on the outside or in on the inside, watching if people suddenly speed up or slow down. If someone takes a drink, it's usually a sign for the, the person to change to another leader. But then no one wants to leave because that's the hardest position because that's the hardest work because you're not on the wash and you're not, your boat's not tilted. Um, but then you also have to do the work at some point to kind of get the respect from the group that you're fit enough and strong enough to be in that group, if you know what I mean. So is it, I love it. It's, I miss it a lot, that kind of tactics and, and playing around and you kind of work together. Sometimes I've had races where um, I've, but yeah race with sort of Australians or Japanese and yeah all around the world countries Europe and you can kind of work together in a group of four for instance and try and move away from the, the group um, that's behind so you can kind of get a bit of space between the two um, but then I've worked with people that don't want to do any work and then the group catches up and then it just becomes bigger and it's you're thinking oh it's, it's um yeah it's an interesting one it's um yeah, look, you never know what's going to happen. You can't plan it either. You just have to go in and try and sort of be safe and, and yeah, be out of danger. <laughs> so when you're pedaling and people are catching up, do you start screaming at each other, going faster, faster? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You go, like, go, 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 they're catching. And then it kind of, it, it shows if they're not fit enough, then they won't. If they will go, they'll paddle on. But if they've generally caught up, it means they'll probably catch up again. So yeah, at that point, then a couple kind of break away and, and be like, right, we don't want to get caught again. Because um, obviously the bigger the group at the finish line, the more danger. And uh, if it, whereas if there's two of you, then yeah, it's um, first or second. Whereas if it's eight of you, you could come anywhere. <laughs> so is it better so, yeah. to just be ahead of everyone and just put everything at the start? Like, how do you? Uh, yes, definitely at the start, it's good to, so for marathon, just to get away from uh, sort of all the, the waves and the paddles and the carnage, um, it's quite a nerve wracking thing being on the start line and waiting for the man to say go, but you just want to go, it's going to be your hardest sort of one minute that you've ever done the race and you just want to go and get a nice flat water 
and then sort of relax a little bit, look around, see where everyone is, and then you try and find a wash because you know you've got another sort of two hours of <laughs> paddling around that you want to, to sort of work together as a team and um, find who's sort of the fittest to, to sort of be in that group. It will naturally happen, yeah, the, the sort of the fittest people will be at the front, the strongest, and then gradually as the race goes on through the hours and the minutes, it will sort of dwindle down and then you're left with the fittest and strongest well, and the luckiest as well. <laughs> yeah, and is there like th your different roles depending on where you're seated? Because wh when I was doing Dragon Boat, like the first ones were the pacers, the engines were in the middle and the, the one at the end would bring it up. Is it the same as well? Yes, so I've always been in the back of the boat. Um, so the first person steers it, sets up a really good rhythm. Um, they're very sort of uh, symmetrical. Um, they've got a very cool, cool, calm head and they're sort of driver of the boat. And then they also have the tiller bar so they can angle left and right. Number two is a really good sort of communicator. So uh, passes, because obviously if you're sitting in the back to the front, I can't hear what the front person's saying and vice versa, they can't hear the back. The so number two, will speak from the first and pass the message down the boat and then number three and four are the engines of the boat really we push the boat on you're staying in time so you're constantly watching um the paddles going left and right and then also my back job is also to make sure if we lining up into the bucket of a start of a sprint race if the angle says so the wind says coming from the right you need to pull your paddles to the right so you angle the boat because you want to be dead straight down the course um, you don't want to be angled one way or the other. So that's the back person's job. Um, and then also, yeah, just to, it sounds silly, but you have a lot of weeds sometimes on courses. So we you can get stuck on the rudder at the back. And yeah, you're just kind of making sure that, that that's sort of clear and you back paddle and you clear it and you throw it away. So everyone's got their roles. And it's interesting um, after sort of a couple of years, you kind of get used to that role. And once we switched it around, and it's very interesting, you sort of get used to your job in that seat, number one, two, three, or four. Then when we switched, I sort of assumed that people could hear me at the back or that you assume that the, the boat is being angled and you appreciate how hard that role is and that you have much more respect for everyone that sat in that seat and the job they're doing. So, yeah, you really respect your teammates and, and what they're doing in that seat. Yeah, I imagine you must know your teammates really, really well just to ensure that you're completely in sync. So what kind of things would you guys be doing to ensure you were just totally aligned? We've been together. So a lot of the team that I raced with at Rio and London, we've known each other for years before I lived with one of them or two of them, actually. Um, and yeah, really good friends. But like even now I talk to a lot of them still, texts and calls. Um, so you're, yeah, we have sort of, we used to have Friday night curry nights or pizza nights. Um, the team was, yeah, there was about eight or eight to ten of us or so. And yeah, it was lovely to, yeah, be sort of building those bridges. And then when it comes to race day, everyone's very different how they prepare. So some people might want to listen to music, um, might go off quiet. Some people might be sort of extra loud and excitable. So it's just working out how everyone operates and sort of working with that so yeah it's it's lovely the team that we had it was it was so tight and you essentially you saw them more than your I sometimes saw them more than my husband on camps or my mum and dad my brothers so you really get to know everyone inside out and sort of what makes them tick and their weaknesses and how to sort of work around them how to get the best out of them so yeah it, it's I really like that side of sometimes you don't have the fastest four athletes makes the fastest four K4. So K4 stands for kayak and then the number four. So it's not always the fastest four makes that K4 the fastest. Sometimes it's how people click and how they paddle together. But it's ultimately, yeah, that team spirit. And if everyone's on the same page, then you've got magical stuff happening. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Wow. And who gets to decide on what makes a K4? Is it the coach then? Coach. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you have your selection race at the beginning of the year in your K1. So you're you're single, and then from that you'll also be ranked and looked at how you're training and how you're doing, and then they put up um, maybe three or four different combinations. But obviously, as the years go by, you kind of. So I was always in the back. Um, I've never been put in the front just because of the years' experience I learned in the back of the boat. Um, meant I was quite suited to that position, but you still have to 
perform and and show that you're fit and strong to sit in that seat. It was it's never a given that you've just given that that seat that, that is yours. Um, so yeah, you have to do a couple of sort of fitness tests that you show that that you're monitored throughout all your training sessions and as you go throughout sort of time trials and selection process. So and then it's down to the coach to decide what's the fastest boat to bring to the Olympics. Yeah, and how does one progress from work like training at a at a club to going to the Olympics? Like, how do you normally progress <laughs> up there? Uh, little, little, tiny steps. So, yeah, when I started off uh, when I was ten, you just sort of doing little club races, and then you build up to going to sort of a sort of hour drive away on Sundays to do races there that your parents drive you to, and then you go overseas, and then you join the British team. Um, so the racing team and then yeah you kind of it's just it, it's built up gradually over the, the years really and um yeah little steps and then the selection policy is brought out and then you think right I'm going to go for this and yeah it's it's tiny little steps but it's if you look at the whole picture it does seem crazy having gone from 10 years old just doing a little race at my canoe club all the way to Olympic final um but yeah, as I say, it, it flies by those years and like I've been yeah, retired for four years now and I'm like, where, where did that time go? Yeah, I mean, you spent almost yeah. 20 years there and that is just incredible yeah. that you dedicate yourself to just one thing. And I was wondering, like, yeah. since the beginning, you know, clearly you were very dedicated to this sport. When you were training, were you thinking, I want to be an Olympian? Like, what were you fighting yeah. for? Absolutely. You're the goal of any athlete, I think, to compete at the Olympics. I think it was always a dream and I never really thought, okay, I'm going to make that one. Um, I think I remember watching it going, well, that'd be pretty cool. And yeah, feeling goosebumps. Um, But I never really knew it was possible. It's just a dream. And then suddenly you're there next day and you're doing the selection race to be considered for a London Olympics and Tokyo. It's um, Rio, sorry. It's, It's sort of just, yeah it kind of it creeps up on you slowly and then suddenly it's there <laughs> yeah and what about um a self-doubt like during especially during the selection process do you face that and how do you overcome it yeah definitely it's uh I think any athlete would be lying if they said they didn't have moments of self-doubt it's it's um you have when you're tired everything comes on top of you everything seems a lot worse than it is and if you've trained three times that day and you're absolutely you're almost numb with sort of pain and your forearms feel cold because they're just yeah you're just basically a zombie um everything seems worse um there were definitely times when I cried just out of pure fatigue and I would speak to my mum and dad or my husband and they just say oh everything's okay in the morning and it was you're just in that kind sort of dark place and yeah fatigue can do a lot to a a mental state but I think the main thing that we practiced a lot is when you're in that tired state that you can keep going that you can try and push it it's just getting that mental strength that when you come to a race and you hit that mental wall of going ah I can't do it you've practiced it millions of times in training that it becomes oh I can go through the wall I I can do this (laughs) Do you always go into a competition and you end up thinking, I really gave it my, oh, I emptied my tank? Or is it a struggle sometimes to do that? The aim is to leave that competition venue and go, I did everything I could to my best ability. It's very hard to do that. It's, um, I definitely haven't, for, for many reasons, done that because you've got so many external factors going on. Um, but you try you, you try and put it all out there um, it's hard when it doesn't go to plan and it's you walk away from the venue going oh, I, I missed the final by three seconds or yeah I didn't have a very good start but you go away you work on it you go back to your coach and go right I need to work on my start more I need to work on my shoulders strength I need to work on um, fitness towards the end of the race and then it, you gradually get better. And then when you come to that ultimate race at the World Championships once every year, you've done all the practice you've done in that whole year to get to that position. And then you lay it all down the line and you give it your best performance. So definitely times when I 
felt like I walked away going, oh, I could have done better because of my start or because I missed my stroke or I didn't warm up correctly or I was rushing or I didn't prepare well or I forgot something and then it takes you off from that moment. But all those little things build up to a crucial point when you can get, you tick all those boxes that you need to tick and then it all just comes together. And when it does, it's the best feeling ever. Like when I've walked away knowing I did everything I could and nailed everything, it's, you got, yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, really good feeling. <laughs> Has there been any particular race that stood up for you that you thought was brilliant? Yeah, when I was younger, I raced with a girl called Rachel Cawthorn and we, see some, some things happen like this and you don't understand. I, uh, so we're racing in a K2, so uh, two of us in the boat and we completely forgot to weigh our boats. Every boat has to be a set weight. And we completely forgot to, so we were uh, rushing around. We we're in Nottingham, um, in the middle of England, and we were trying to get the boat up to weight. And we ran up, um, we quickly piled up to the start line, 500 meters, and we didn't even have time. Normally, you have about 20 minutes to warm up. We had about three minutes to get up to the race, and we were just ru- paddling so hard that that was our warm up. We turned around, and we had the best race ever. And I can't. I, I, it still amazes me that we didn't do the proper warm up. We didn't talk about the race. We just somehow were in sync with each other. Um, we're living together. We just went as hard as we could. We just put heads down. I think it's because we didn't think too much sometimes. Sometimes overthinking is almost detrimental. And I walked away and we both <laughs> finished and we were just like, oh, <laughs> where did that come from? Um, so that again, I learned from that experience that maybe overthinking too much and being too serious and being too focused is is maybe not the best for some reason. Like it's so you you learn as you go through the years, um, and then yeah, I think probably Rio and London, obviously the races there, you because it's an end of a cycle and it's this big sort of build up. Um, I gave it my all there, where you just collapse at the finish line and you just you it just feels you're just. <laughs> It's really quite dangerous being on the water as well when you feel so exhausted. But um, yeah, those two races for me. And then little ones when I was at the club and I thought I couldn't hang on and I managed to because, I yeah, my coach was shouting at me. Um, and yeah, lots of sessions leading into the sort of winter of really hard, gruesome sessions where you think, I just I want to go and curl up in bed. But now you, you crack on and you feel so much proud prouder for doing it and finishing it off. Yeah. Was there ever a moment that you wanted to give up? Kayaking altogether. Yeah. Because yeah. it's yeah. brutal. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, probably. So when I was younger, um, I think I were going into winter, another winter, and I just thought, oh, gosh, this is quite hard. Um, like winters, it's a tough, um, long slog uh, for a lot of European countries. It's, it gets quite dark and quite yeah gloomy and, and cold obviously um so a moment then and then I think it was quite tough um I, so I had to go I, uh when was I it was 2008 I think I was quite um yeah I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue um but yeah no I think it was just you're quite tired a lot of the time when you think these thoughts <laughs> yeah and I think it was in 2006 was it when you moved to Marlow Buckinghamshire to train with the GB yeah. kayaking team was, yes, that dif- yes. was that difficult to have to actually physically move to train away from family? Um, I think it, I was really excited because we were living in a, a kayaking house. So there was a lot of, uh, it was, I was living with my teammates. Um, it was by the river. Um, it was, for me, it was really exciting. Um, I don't think I remember feeling nervous. Um, as I say, my parents were only sort of 45 minute drive away. So I was very lucky with that. And, yeah, I think because we all, there was me and another, my housemate, Rachel, we both moved out together at the same time. So it was quite a nice transition that we were both sort of cooking dinners together going, ah, like, <laughs> um, this is normally like, yeah, it's it's a, a new sort of territory. Um, but yeah, it, for me, uh, yeah, the team was really good and every girl like we got on and had sort of say pizza nights on Fridays and Saturday nights. So that was nice. Um, sort of having that team bond yeah and what was the lifestyle like I think that you were training from once a week to three times a week to three times a day six days a week something like that right like that sounds crazy (laughs) what kind of what was the lifestyle like 
<laughs> it was um yes yeah, so, so you train three days a week um monday tuesday uh wednesday was two days and then back to three so you have a, a rest afternoon half day on wednesday and then two sessions uh, three sessions thursday friday and then saturday and then sunday's your rest day so it was quite you don't have any time to work really um it was it was very full-on and i think some people may have done degrees but it was so hard to, to study as well um, hats off to anyone who did that or is doing it because it's it's a full-time job um and then yeah sundays you're basically walking around like a zombie refueling for the next week washing your kit gonna buy some more food um might see sort of friends and family but to be honest you're so tired that you don't really want to almost you just want to watch lie down watch tv all day and just eat um and then get ready for the next sort of week training so it, it the weeks flew by um and the sessions yeah were really tough but I loved them each each session was like a little challenge that you can sort of tick off you've got all your scores your data and your weights you're lifting and shifting and for me it was sort of like a little progression in your mind that you're getting fitter and stronger and um, the coach is sort of monitoring you and you're supporting your teammates as well to be or you're showing up representing yourself and also that you're there for your teammates so that when you come to race you know that you're going to be there for each other it's that feeling of knowing that you're not the only one on the start line that you're all racing together that you have each other's back and you're going to absolutely deplete yourself for each other which was just the best team that we had I think yeah wow and like was there so you mentioned food earlier was there a particular diet that all of you had to be on or was it just you have to refuel and make sure you have enough energy uh so we mainly is, is driven by obviously a lot of protein we had a nutritionist and he uh sort of individual plan so some of us as they was um sort of more protein or some of us was to lose, uh, gain more muscle or lose more fat so everyone's different everybody is different um so everyone sort of had their own individual goal and target that they needed to hit um it's it's quite um yeah as a, as a team you support each other um it, we're very much foodies we all love food and different recipes and trying to get protein powder in and making it with sort of peanut butter and honey and just having it as sort of protein balls or whatever so it's it was always going oh i made this at the weekend and you sort of pass recipes around um but yeah we're all massive foodies and love yeah eating and and yeah it was we ate a lot as well <laughs> it was quite hard when i retired to suddenly cut down because my body was used to this sort of vast amount of quality, calories a day and then suddenly to go oh hang on a minute i can't eat that <laughs> yeah and i wonder you mentioned briefly that it's quite hard to do all your training with like studying for instance because i spoke to another olympian she said that she had to pay her entire way through just to go to the olympics was it the same case for you uh different? no so we were very lucky we're sponsored by or um with uh yeah had uk sport lottery funded and uh depending on the position you came at the world championship meant you yeah got a certain amount of funding on top of that you had sponsorship so we had uh you can ask the boats or paddles or kits food equipment cars even um and then you can have lo local councils can sort of give you sponsorships so yeah a grant so i think it's different i'm not sure how the other countries do it but in britain yeah depending on where you are ranked in the world or however each sport do it dictates how much funding you're on so is kayaking considered one of the better funded sports then um i don't know in terms of um money wise um you can live off the the income they give you and then i can i guess it's off your own back how back how much you uh drive for sort of sponsorship yourself so whether you're sort of yeah i, I remember writing letters to companies asking for you know, go for supplements or peanut butter or <laughs> any protein bars that you think is going to fuel your um diet and your sort of overall lifestyle um and companies yeah some obviously you don't hear from but some send out little samples so that obviously yeah all tallies up um but yeah so some people got free paddles um if you sort of won a world championships you can get free paddles out of that as a kind of reward and it's all sponsorship so 
a certain brand then you can get pictures with them and then they it's like a two-way street obviously if you um yeah working with brands and yeah building up a rapport with them is, is very good was it difficult to reach out to brands i mean you have to put yourself um, out there into not just training yeah yeah it's um it's quite hard because obviously kayaking is not a big big sport compared to sort of football or tennis or um athletics so you yeah you haven't got that sort of main um sort of media coverage as a lot of sports have but i think i remember typing up um email sending them out um i just thought if i don't try i don't know so you get some answers back um and yeah very lucky that um you can have some sponsorship with some companies um but yeah it's sort of yeah off your own bat and a lot of um, athletes at the moment are yeah sponsors that have sort of individual sponsorship outside of their main one um that is given by uk sport but yeah we're very lucky to have sponsorship from uk sport yeah and what about like going to the olympics itself because you went twice so were the experiences very very different for you yes absolutely london was um so it was obviously home games and you can bring i had my aunt and uncle and neighbors all around there and it was for me it was it, we trained where we raced at the olympics with dorney lake in eton that was um where we trained every day so we knew that london was happening there so when when i moved there we knew that in sort of six years time the the race is going to happen there so we knew the lake inside out we knew yeah everything about it um, and then Rio is obviously this massive unknown. You've got the heat, the colour, the carnival, the vibe. Um, yeah, everything was outdoorsy. It was a very different, um, yeah, environment. But both races-wise, um, yeah, very different races. Um, different kind of tactics we used, um, different preparation. So they're very different. But, um, yeah, both are very, very special to me. Do you have a particularly favourite moment from those two competitions? London, for me, was when we walked out into the opening ceremony and David Bowie and We Could Be Heroes came on. And I remember just looking around. um, And obviously, because as a kayaker, you don't really have massive stadiums because it's outdoors. So this stadium was packed with 80,000 people. And I remember just looking around and my cheeks were aching so much um, from just um, looking around and, and being like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Um, so that for me, and I was with my teammates and we were just bouncing and hopping and giggling so much. So yeah, David Bowie, We Could Be Heroes. And every time I hear it now on the radio, I just think of that moment walking out. Um, and then Rio for me, when I finished my racing, um, I knew I was kind of, I was debating whether retiring. Um, my body was sort of giving up on me a little bit, um, but I also, I wasn't sure. I was on the fence, and um, my family had phoned out. To, I'm very lucky to, yeah, have them there, and my husband. And uh, I remember we finished racing, and my husband gave me the massive hug, and he had tears in his eyes. He's a man who doesn't cry very often, um, and. Uh, gave me the biggest hug ever and it was all sort of hot and sticky and I saw my parents and then that evening we went to the um, stadium to watch Mo Farah race and I just remember thinking I don't want to be anywhere else in the world right now I'm so happy that I have my family my husband um, I know I've got sort of a couple months off to recover and think where I'm at and I just thought I don't want to be anywhere else like I'm just this is the best and I had the stadium and the bus from that and yeah, I knew I was just, yeah, very, very happy at that moment. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. And do you have like, because we all have these conceptions about what the Olympics is, right? And the media always portrays it in a certain way. Is there anything that about the Olympics that you think people don't normally know about? Be, given that you I think there? probably the, the years that you give before that one moment. So no athlete has suddenly got out of bed that day, having spent sort of a couple of sessions, um, it's years of, of work before that. So Jessica Ennis, Timo Farah, all the, all the swimmers, all the divers, everyone, um, they spent hours and years and yeah, in that swimming pool, in their gym, in, in that moment, in that boat training. Um, and I think you probably look at other sports. So I had a go at sort of rowing and it, 
it you take for granted how sort of easy each sport make it look so cyclists for instance doing tour de france they go on for four five six hours and then can go sprinting at the end up this hill and you just think how on earth they do that so i think you take for granted how easy each sport make it look so sort of javelin it's just yeah they make it look so fluid um but yeah years and years of um tears and uh, upset and joy and happiness and injury that brings that one moment on that start line and that sort of 30 40 two hour effort you just see that little snippet but there's so much more that happens behind the scene leading up to it <laughs> absolutely is there a particular moment that really touched you perhaps that was a very personal moment for you at the olympics or yeah um i think it, anything both olympics getting the kit that's such a for london it was just so exciting and just having that first sort of round of olympic rings and being like oh my gosh like you're part of the team and everyone's getting the same kit um and then yeah rio again just the excitement that it's kind of confirmation that you've made it and the whole process is just so exciting um and then i think just watching the world's best perform and trying to uh, yeah trying to be there and beat them and and you know that each country has had the same really tough selection to get their best team to that finish line or to that start um so you know you're racing the absolute best of the best um and everyone is at their peak so it's yeah it's really a, a lovely feeling walking around the village where you just got really strong athletes that are just everywhere like all sports it's everyone looks really big and strong and healthy it's it's pretty cool it's it's, it's a really weird vibe when you walk around <laughs> yeah yeah and b- given that you were on the forefront your spot for so long what do you think separates like great athletes from the best athletes um who oh, has a tricky one uh i think how you prepare it's um some people are quite sort of yeah um yeah some people prepare differently um and then it's how you put yourself out there it's making the best of a situation so you can either take a look at the weather and go oh no it's windy I can't do that oh no I forgot this I can't do that oh no I don't feel so good I'm tired it's changing that attitude to yeah I can do that um and it's just uh, yeah difference between a good athlete to great athlete is sort of making the most of the situation I think um it's turning around making it work for you so yeah maybe windy but it's windy for everyone I may have forgotten um my t-shirt but it's okay because my teammates have got something it's it's always looking for another alternative that's going to get you through and then just preparing making sure that you don't end up in that situation that you you've done enough um years of sort of forgetting things that you come down to that moment that you don't forget (laughs) Yeah, and you you alluded to it briefly earlier, but like after the first Olympics, were you thinking again whether to retire before you went for your second and decided to retire? How does it work? No, after London, I was still quite young. I was thinking, yeah, no one to go again. I took uh, four months off, so I went traveling. Um, yeah, around in India, Vietnam, Cambodia, where I met my husband, which was really nice. Um, and then, yeah, I was still keen to jump back in the boat. Whereas, yeah, Rio, I was quite, yeah, so I was 28, which doesn't seem old in kai- in sort of uh, athlete's term, but in kayaking, it was quite old, no, yeah, oldish. Um, you wouldn't really see an athlete pass or 35, or 32, 35. Um, so, yeah, I kind of knew that I was sort of on the edge and my body was giving up anyway I had sort of little niggles here and there um and it's just my my body was obviously saying hang on a minute you can't keep pushing me through all these gym sessions and these running sessions because you you can't do it (laughs) yeah and what was the point where you decided that you had to listen to your body and just stop being this elite athlete I started yeah I started training so into the winter sort of November I went back um and like a lot of athletes will take a lot of time off after each cycle um and I just didn't have that motivation that buzz that excitement because it takes a lot of hard work to get up every morning out of bed with your muscles already feeling flat because you've done a really hard session the day before um and I just thought I can't do this like I and I was trying to find that motivation but I remember speaking to my coach and he said if you don't have it you can't find it it's just it's yeah it's quite hard to constantly chase it 
um, and motivation is the main reason why you do it. You're driving forward for that sort of PB or that um, more weight to be added on to your discs or yeah, to go faster than you did yesterday or the week before. But if that motivation for those times to come down or for you to run faster or lift more is never there, you're just kind of flopping along and then you're, that's, you kind of lost that fire, that spark. Um, and yeah, discussing with my husband, we kind of just thought, mm, well, let's look to sort of move on, a um, new challenge in life. And yeah, he's always wanted to have little children. So yeah, I think that was a big driver as well for me. <laughs> was it scary for you to make that final decision to step away? Absolutely. It was, if I wasn't a kayaker, who was I? What was I doing? If I wasn't going to the gym, if I wasn't swimming three times a week, if I wasn't going out on the water, what was I doing? Um, and I do remember feeling after I had my time off, the holiday, the relaxing time, um, where you've eaten all the chocolate biscuits you want, you kind of feel like, wait, no, let's go back to reality. How am I going to pay the mortgage? How am I going to, what am I going to do with my day? So it, it's, a, it's, I think, any athlete that suddenly stops and doesn't have a next career path to follow feels massively lost. There's no one taking over your shoulder going, what time are you doing, Lou? How fast are you padding, Lou? Like it is, there's no one checking in on you. And I had that for 20, nearly 20 years and someone to prove, uh, something to prove against or something to race against a clock, a weight. So it was very strange. Um, I started training again, but very lightly, um, but not a, at a high level that I was. Um, and then, yeah, got into work. But it did take, like, only just now, some four years out, um, and I qualified as a personal trainer, um, yes, nearly 10 months ago. Um, it's taken a while to really go, who am I? Like, I had my daughter, so I was obviously then a mum, still fitness, like, fanatic, still train once a day. But it, it did take a while for me to sort of, you have lots of wobbly moments, going, waking up in the morning, going... I have nothing to race against today. <laughs> There's always that clock to race that I had. So yeah, and it like I still have races against myself and my husband. Like we still do 5K time trials and um, yeah, like little competitions and press up competitions, challenges. And I don't think they will ever go um, because I, I love the yeah against the numbers. But yeah, it's a a big sort of gap that you kind of have to fill and no one can do that for you you have to find that yourself so whether you become a coach or you completely change careers or you go into sort of a lot of um athletes have gone into sort of uh, journalism or um yeah broadcasting that's great so you're still within sport because you've got so many years of knowledge and uh, experience and sort of know-how it seems a waste to lose it so then when i found coaching and personal training it slotted in so well it was just my brother suggested to me and I just thought oh yeah this sounds right on my street it's, I can do sport every day and I can help other people and I can push people and I can push people to to get faster is for me it's lovely to yeah find a career that suits me now <laughs> yeah and how did you go through that journey of discovering who you were because I understand after you left that you were with Wood Group for two and a half years yeah so yeah. How, how was so, that like transitioning over to what you're now doing so with that I think um I remember going to work um I yeah got a really good um, friend from there um Michael and uh he yeah we got on so well and still in contact and I think he it was my first sort of proper job and he taught me so much um and I, yeah I think it was I remember feeling quite lost there and I we were just doing up our house so that was my focus um but yeah it was um it, it was a funny time when I think back it was a quite a short job um but yeah I, I, I say you you just have to learn from each sort of career that we went into I went then to join another company after that um and all those little jobs that I did have helped me so with admin um, it's helped me sort of form emails, which I never used to have, the skills of Excel, which I never had. So all these people were asking me how I can, how can I use Word and Excel? And I said, I've never used a, a, a computer to work before. I'm, I'm really good in the gym though, which doesn't yeah. help. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I've no idea like how many words a minute I can do. Um, I, yeah, it's, 
it's a very different environment but yeah I think it's um it's a strange one that you're um you just have to kind of make the most of each situation I guess you just try and go the best you can um so yeah it's a uh, it's an imagine, interesting one, but I think you'd find yourself. <laughs> imagine it being quite hard because, you know, for the first time you have these fixed hours, you're working indoors at a seat, you're working from the bottom up all over again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, I remember being, um, like, I, I, it was, for me, it was a job and I paid the bills, so it ticked that box. And then I think I was thinking, right, how can I go better? How can I make myself sort of work up the company again? Because you are starting from the bottom. Um, it's almost like going from school. You go from sort of yeah working through the, the the years um and I like that I remember sort of going right what more responsibilities can I have how can I improve this system how can I do that um yeah give me more things to do more tasks um so I guess it kind of transitioned like the two sports and, and working um and then yeah stepping up again to my next job again trying to think right how can I go better or yeah how can I like with that athlete kind of mindset um, and then, yeah, also going for runs on lunch breaks and <laughs> getting yeah. my sport fixed in there. I read that you were what, cycling 20 kilometers round trip every day yeah. to work and like running yeah. skiing during lunch breaks. <laughs> so you just couldn't get sports out of your life. Yeah, I was thinking, oh, maybe it will just fade away after time. And, and then sort of three years in, I was like, no, this really isn't going anywhere. I'm still training. <laughs> um, and I saw, yeah, cycling to and from work just as a commute, but actually it was, I think deep down I knew that it was my kind of daily exercise ticked um and then when someone say at work oh let, let's go for a little run i be like yeah yeah I'm in I'm in or let's go for a spin I'm like yeah yeah I'm there so I was always looking for um that that sort of sport um adrenaline kick um so it was quite hard I think being in an office um but it was yeah you just make the most of it and I'd say cycle to and from work so that was a good um but yeah very lucky now to to be running with my clients and doing workouts with them and yeah doing sport every day still so it's it's good um I've gone back to kayaking a little bit so I was paddling this morning at six o'clock on the river and I lost I, I I felt like I lost a little bit of my love for kayaking but this summer these past couple of months I've found it again um going back to my local canoe club Elbridge and yeah done early morning sessions before my day starts and just put me in a good place watch the sunrise um, and yeah, I'm, I'm so happy whenever I talk to my husband after I'm just on cloud nine. So I'm just, it's so, it makes me so happy. Um, the action of kayaking, I think just being on the water um, and just, yeah, paddling to the best that you can technically is just, yeah, I love it. It's good. <laughs> Did it never cross your mind to maybe train future athletes in kayaking so you could be in the water again? I did think that um I do do a little bit with the little kids at the club um and I really like seeing just little tweaks that I can help them with and and um yeah little movements um but unfortunately the base for the British team um is two hours north in Nottingham so um and also I quite I I think when I was looking at jobs I kind of kayaking is such a small um group of people and athletes that you can train um whereas PTing is you've got pre and postnatal which I love you've got elderly you've got sort of all different people in different phases of their life that I quite like to help and alongside that you've got the lifestyle that I can sort of tap into see what diet you're sleeping what you're doing day to day that I lived and and sort of was trying to always make the best of so I like to help people in that way whereas with these athletes they're fantastically trained I just feel that my um, coaching ability is probably aren't as advanced as the coaches that they have in the team yeah and can you share a bit about your personal training which I understand that you're currently doing now I mean like how's life yeah. been like do you feel that this is your current why yeah definitely this is my career I'm so happy in it it's it's so exciting but um yes yeah, so I can um, obviously be flexible around my little daughter um I can yeah help people it's it's so nice to see them progress and hit their goals um it sounds really sort of cheesy but it's so it gives me such a a lovely feeling that when I say right we're going to run from here to here and then we repeat it and they go faster and they didn't know how they did it but it somehow something clicks in their brain that you can kind of tap into and obviously the longer I work with clients the more I can um understand what sort of makes them tick if they prefer that kind of quiet calm focused or if they 
um, for encouragement or positivity. It's working out how they how they operate. Um, and just seeing their faces when they did something they didn't think they could do or lift something and I just like you did that and they said no no you helped me I said no you did it it was all your your job like you did it um so yeah then, then just exercises in general just makes everyone feel good I've had some people some clients come to me in the morning going I'm really flat I had a you know I went to sleep at 2 a.m and I'm like you're here that's all you like step one tick let's just crack on um and then yeah pre and postnatal women uh to begin with to have a child and it's just amazing itself and then to come out the other side of that and to kind of get that strength back that is, is just amazing so I think um, supporting women postnatally has been really a, a pleasure I think there's a lot of trust um, that is involved in between me and the client so they've had obviously they've gone through these uh, this big change in their body physically um and their bodies yeah changed dramatically and then they come to me and ask to sort of yeah whatever their goals are um so there's a lot of trust there which i really respect um but yeah i, I love what i do um have two days a week where i work full time so mum and dad take my little one um and yeah just get sort of admin done and yeah i i'm very lucky <laughs> Yeah, and how has COVID impacted you and what you're doing right now? If anything, it's actually pushed me online. So at the beginning of this, I was thinking, oh gosh, how am I going to see clients, clients face to face, and how am I going to, yeah, interact with them? Um, but yeah, I saw a lot of classes going online, and then yeah, decided that okay, I'll jump on with them, and it's actually. For me, I've been very lucky. It's it's gone the opposite way. So I've been able to then have more clients because I'm not travelling around as much, um, and it's a lot easier. I think um, clients are more comfortable in their own home. Um, gyms can be very daunting, sort of wearing lycra, mirrors everywhere, lights, music. For someone who's not in that sort of comfortable, it's quite a, a scary place. I totally get that. So, um, I and it, it's great. I mean, as I say, no travel, I can get more clients in and support more people um i still do face to face um with limited equipment so that side's quite tricky but i think being outdoors i yeah you can still stay two meters apart and it's absolutely fine um you just can't high five them or <laughs> give them a hug when they've done really well but um yeah it's for me yeah i've built my studio here so it's um it's a good good little setup i have <laughs> Yeah. Do you think PT virtu done virtually is as effective as in person? You probably can't see their eyes or their cheeks um, and sort of get a, a gauge on how sort of sometimes technology obviously doesn't give that away. Um, or if they're sweating or if, you, if they can see the pain in their eyes, they're doing like a plank and their head down and they're sort of squinting. You can't see that. Um, but then there's that constant communication. I'm constantly asking, where are you on a scale of one to 10? How do you feel? Are you okay? Um, if they've got any little niggles, I'll check in regularly. So it's probably opened up the communication um, sort of back and forth a lot more. Um, yeah, it's it's different. Um, and a lot of people apologize for sort of, because you're in the room, they go, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm breathing really loud. I'm like, it's fine, don't worry. Like, it's a good sign. It's a good thing that you're you're talking, you're breathing loudly. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And where do you see your future? Have you planned it out? I hope that I'll continue with this. So, um, supporting my clients as I go. Um, yeah, having the studio set up at home. And, yeah, just keep on, um, yeah, helping people. I love uh, little tweaks, like with their diet. Um, people sort of going, oh, I didn't know that had so, so, so much protein in it, or oh, I found this new food, these swapping recipes. Um, I just love that kind of um, just helping people, yeah, achieve the best. Like I, I try to do, you're trying to constantly aim for the better you. So helping people achieve that is just, yeah, it's lucky. I'm very lucky. <laughs> yeah. And before we wrap up, I wonder, would you recommend your daughter to be an, an elite athlete if that's what she wants to do? Yes. Really? <laughs> I think because um, sport to me was such a big like in our family um, it was so big such a big part of our life and it it shapes you so well like team sports it makes you stronger physically and mentally I think the yeah the 
the benefit on your heart and your lungs and everything is just yeah it's brilliant um and also my husband's very tall and I'm sort of quite tall for a woman so it'd be I feel like it'd be a waste if she didn't use her long arms and long legs um but obviously I'm not going to be a pushy parent um and yeah if she doesn't want to do something then that's fine but I will be exposing her to lots of sports hopefully that she's one then one that she likes <laughs> amazing so you don't think that parents should be pushy and just tell the child friends to just go for it and find out whether you really like it or not I think yeah I think it's a fine line so um I know a couple of uh sort of family friends that um yeah they're sort of exposing their child to sort of netball and kayaking and football and um all these different sports swimming athletics and then sort of hoping that one will maybe stick so for me I did swimming um I did uh, netball and then I did kayaking I was just like kayaking it, it, that's it for me like I just felt so comfortable and I loved it and I kept asking mum and dad to take me down to the club so I think yeah being pushy to a certain extent but then at the same time you don't want to force your child to do something and then they arrive up to the the rugby pitch in tears and in a big state like it's kind of <laughs> I think um yeah and then hoping that something will, will drop and they'll just go I really love this and this is what I want to do but then again if, if it's not it doesn't have to be sport it can be music it can be art it can be theatre I think it's just finding one passion that really makes them happy really like kayaking for me made me so happy it still does make me so happy I I look forward to going paddling I look forward to that hour of just really pushing myself and me time and, and challenging myself so yeah I think for if my daughter finds something like that that I did then I'll be yeah very lucky and very happy. <laughs> do you think there's something that parents can do to make that whole experience more enjoyable and fun? Probably trying different things and on, on sort of family holidays um on yeah summer holidays going out there and just you know booking a an afternoon in the kayak or yeah having a go on a bicycle um just exposing them to lots of different sports and just seeing if anything fires anything inside so a lot of my mum's friends um have got some older kids and they say oh yeah we went cycling the other day and they really enjoyed it and we're gonna go buy a new helmet so it's exciting those little things and um yeah something that just ticks in their brain that they go mum can we go paddling again or mum can we go down to the the running track again so yeah exposing lots of different things and just seeing what happens seeing where they they fall in love <laughs> And what about for grown-ups? I think you probably have a better idea. Like we go to work and we're coming back, we're tired and we think, oh, I really should exercise. And then you end up not doing it and a week or a month passes and you never do it. So how do you like, almost encourage yourself to get up and just move? Do you have any tips for I that? I think doing exercise in the morning just sets the tone for the day. I think, I know some people might be morning people, some people might be evening. I think it's really just getting up and, ha and preparing for your trainers, your running top, your leggings, just having them there by your bed ready to go so you can't walk past them without seeing them and tripping over them. I think starting your day off with that and it almost puts you in a good mood um, and then having known that you've done your exercise for the day um, and that it's almost a little reminder as well when you, not that you don't have to eat certain foods, but if you have a cookie and they think, oh, I really like another second cookie, it's almost in your mind going, well, I worked really hard this morning, so it's not that it's going to do it, but you're sort of thinking, oh, like, do I really need that? <laughs> so it's sort of the diet as well comes hand in hand, so you're eating well, training well. Um, and, yeah, like, obviously days when you want many cookies, <laughs> that's the only thing that's going to tick the box. Um, but, yeah, start the day off right with um, a bit of exercise. Even if it's just a 20-minute walk around the block, you don't have to be jumping around, you don't have to be... Um, yeah lifting heavy weights it's just moving your body simply just getting that heart rate pumping and just yeah get that feel good endorphin rush after and then have a nice shower and start your day yeah well thank you so much Louisa for your time today I normally end with these questions the first one is do you feel that you have found my why okay found my why oh that's deep <laughs> um yeah I think so um yeah I feel like I'm yeah here for my husband and my daughter and then to support others is that what you mean as in yeah like your purpose in life like, your drive like everyone yeah. is your friend yeah and I feel purpose now I, I think I was lost for a bit after Rio 
but I feel like I've found I've found my place yeah and what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind some of my Rio kids my daughter <laughs> um, or my yeah, grandchildren um, and yeah I think changing people if, if they block it book in block a session or something that they've they've had a session where they've really developed themselves and I've sort of assisted in that way um, even if it's just how they do a press up or how they yeah how they're determined to sort of chase a new goal um I think yeah hopefully that I have some sort of um yeah I can help people to, to have a little reminder for going forward by themselves so and where can people sorry before that what do you think are the most important qualities an elite athlete should have Ooh, um mental strength is definitely one um motivation that fire within I think having a calm, clear mind when you come to race. So it's very easy to get panicky and this is the crowds and all the pressure build up. But it's almost calming down and going to sort of a calm meditative state and just and sort of going, Yeah, okay, I'm I'm just gonna yeah, breathe here for a second. I've done this many a times and just really focus on, on what that needs to be done and that you, you can do it. It's a positive, calm relaxed state I'd say and where can people go to find out more about you and connect with you uh so my website so www.louisafitness.co.uk uh, I'm also on Instagram um so yeah message me and say hi amazing and is there anything else that you would like to share we haven't covered so far um no I think it's all good um yeah very honored very yeah thank you for asking me lots of questions it's um it definitely it makes me realize how much I love kayaking. A little bit obsessed with it. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Maybe you should go yeah. back to it full time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Lisa, for your time. I've loved this. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>